there's some Sundays after the music where I'm just like, why should I even talk? Just like, hey, see ya, all right? Because that right there was, uh, that song is basically a sermon. Uh, and it's a sermon that you will remember. Uh, there's a worship leader in North Carolina, his name's Matt Papa, that's what he says, he says, worship songs are just sermons that people actually remember. I was like, oh, nice, thanks for that. But it's true, the music will help you remember it, um, and there's so much truth in that, talking about that Jesus is worthy. And I really love that passage in Revelation, what an awesome, what an awesome way for us to uh, review what we've been talking about. Last week we talked about having an eternal mindset. How do you see the world? And it's basically you have two choices. You can either see it with a lens, or my glasses is a perfect example. This is how, it's a paradigm, all right? A paradigm is how you see the world, all right? And so you can say, all right, how do I see the world? Well, I see it, my glasses are eternally focused, where everything everything I see is going to go through the lens of focusing on the eternal, having the eternal mindset. Or it could be, you know, my glasses, my worldview, my paradigm is temporal, worldly things, where everything I look at is just what's right in front of me, what's tomorrow, what's, you know, what's the next thing to do. And so I hope and challenge us all to be looking with eternal lenses, looking everything that happens to us, every opportunity we have, every interaction we have with people, we can view that through an eternal lens. And even if it's bad stuff, still view it with an eternal lens because the end is known. The end, people always like to debate, you know, Revelation you know, what, what does this mean and what does that mean? And I just tell them, like, we can debate all we want, we can talk about, but basically here's what you need to know. In the end, Jesus wins. And that's, that's it. I mean, and that's the best thing. So, uh, we're going to be talking about continuing through our study of Philippians. If you have not yet, I encourage you to pull, if you don't have your Bibles with you, pull this out so you can follow along. Uh, basically, last week we talked about the eternal mindset. We talked about how, to have an eternal mindset, we have to really root out our idols and our sin. And one of the biggest paradigm shifts, if you're going to have, if you're going to see through, see things through the eternal lens, is how do you view life, and more importantly, how do you view death? And that's what we're going to be talking about. And it's always a subject that can be uncomfortable. Uh, some people are dealing with death very recently in their family. Some people have never experienced that. And so we're all, I just want to acknowledge before we begin that we're all in different stages of thinking about death. And if you've never thought about it before, well, get ready because you're going to think about it now. So here is what uh, Paul is writing in Philippians 1. And remember, he is in prison when he's writing this. He's in prison, and he writes, yes. I will rejoice. That right there is a huge paradigm shift. I'm in prison, I've been abandoned, people are mocking me, but I'm going to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Holy Spirit, there the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. And it, it, it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body whether by life, meaning I get out of prison, I continue my ministry, or with my death, which was a very real possibility with what Paul was facing. Here's the uncomfortable thing we're going to talk about first. Death is a certainty. All of us are going to experience that. From the moment you're born, immediately that's your end. That's where, we're all, that's where we're all going. There's a quote from a movie I like where if you trace everyone's, uh, um, if you tra- on a long enough timeline, the survival rate of everyone drops to zero. Because it's just a reminder that this is temporary. We take each day for granted. We think we have all this time, but we're not guaranteed that time. And a lot of us don't like to think about our end because it makes us uncomfortable. And some people will say, very cynically, well, really, dying is the most human thing you can do. Because it's very the cynical statement of, you know, we are all going to have to face it. It all is going to happen to us. And when, it, we just don't know when. But I don't like to think of it as the most human thing we can do because of our reaction to death. 
The way we react to death, C.S. Lewis, the guy that wrote The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, Chronicles of Narnia, he said the way we react to death proves that in our heart of hearts we know this is not how it's supposed to be. And the Bible agrees. It's not that death is the most human thing to do. It's actually the most inhuman thing because God did not design it this way. Death happens because creation is broken. And death happens because of sin. But as long as we're living in this world, it is a reality that we're going to face. It happened to Paul. It's going to happen to each and every one of us. Some people are big into making bucket lists. You got to, who has a bucket list? You can be honest. You don't have to raise your hand, but you know you people, you have a bucket list. You're thinking, I'm going to do this, 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 and this. And it's very good. You have, you're living with intentionality. And some of us, and this is going to sound really weird, some of us are fortunate enough to have a doctor give us a diagnosis and say, you only have this much time left. A year, eight months, six months. You're thinking, that's terrible news. But how do you start living at that moment when you know you only have eight months left? You don't waste time nearly as much as you wasted before. And you start being really intentional Maybe you say you love somebody that you haven't sold that to in a long, long time. Maybe you reach out to friends. You start living very, very intentionally, and that is where Paul's at. Because Paul is saying this. The the main point of this passage is when a Christian is prepared to die, that's when we're really ready to live. When we're prepared to die, that's when we're really ready to live. Specifically, that's when we start living how God intended us to live. That's where Paul is at mentally. That's what Paul is thinking through when he writes probably one of the most provocative sentences in the entire New Testament. is verse 21. This is one you probably know. This, if, if, if you talk about Philippians, this is one of the top five verses that people know in Philippians. He says this, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Hear how provocative that is. To live is Christ. We're going to talk about what that means. To die is gain. That is very, that's counterintuitive. That's not what we are programmed to think. But since we're already talking about death, let's just go ahead and get this over with. Let's talk about that part first, and then we'll end on the happy part, talking about Christ, you know, to live is Christ. He says, for me, to die is gain. And gain, obviously, hopefully, you know what it means. It's not just a laundry detergent. Oh, good, you can still hear me. All right, just, just checking. That's not the one I use personally. I'm more of an all guy myself. I don't know which one you use. Maybe you like Tide, cold water, whatever. You know, it's just cold call. Gain means you get, you get profit. You get something beneficial, something that's good. All right, D.L. Moody, very famous evangelist in the late 1800s, founder of the Moody Bible Institute, He said this, he said, at some point, one day, you're going to read in the papers that D.L. Moody has died. Don't you believe it? At that moment, D.L. Moody will be more alive than he's ever been before. Because he knew that death, as uncomfortable as we feel when we talk about it, for a Christian, it is a homecoming. It's a homecoming, and it's one to rejoice over. Now, death is difficult for those those of us left behind. We're the ones that have to bear the sorrow where we miss people. But for the Christian who's died, they're not, no more sorrow, no more pain. They're with Jesus, and that's pretty awesome. But I want to make clear, I want to make sure you understand that when Paul is writing that, he's saying to die is gain, he does not have a death wish. He's not saying, oh, I can't wait till it's over. My old woe is me. I'm in prison again after I've been beaten again, after I was shipwrecked again. I mean, he, was, he didn't have a death wish. And we know that because the way he continues. He knows he doesn't have a death wish because he knows his mission is not done yet. He knows God has given him a mission to reach the, the Gentile people. And he knows he's not done. And we know this in verse 22. He says, if I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. That means I can keep doing the mission that God has given me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your accounts. 
Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. What I find striking about Paul's decision-making process, you know, should I stay or should I go? Should I live or should I die? Notice how much emphasis he's placing on, it's not himself. Who's he worried about? He's worried about the people in Philippi. He's worried about the people in Thessalonica. He's worried about people in Colossae. He's worried about all these people that he has met, that he's led to Christ, and all these churches that he's founded. And he's like, and I don't know if I can go yet because you still need, God still wants to use me to reach you. He has other believers' well-being placed above his own. Here's Paul's idea of his well-being. Here's everybody else. That's why he's like, you know, I can live, I can die, whatever, but I know that God wants me here. To have an eternal mindset, to truly live worthy of the gospel, because that's what this whole Philippian sermon series is about, it cannot be about you. If you want to live the Christian life, it cannot be about you. It has got to be about other people. And yes, as we've talked about the past couple weeks, sometimes that's going to make you uncomfortable. And yes, sometimes people are going to ask you to do things you don't want to do, or they're going to challenge you to do something different. But if you really want to live with an eternal mindset, you say, you know what? I'm willing to be uncomfortable. I'm willing to do something different. If that means somebody else can come to Christ, then sign me up. I'll be as uncomfortable as I need to be. It cannot be about you. See, the gospel is not treasure to be hoarded. Oh, it's mine, it's mine, it's mine. You can't have it. No, the gospel are riches to be shared. It's not hoarding me, 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 me. It's this is awesome. You take it, you take it. You need this, you need this. It's the lesson that Scrooge McDuck learned in DuckTales. That's right. The classic story of DuckTales. Ooh. Thank you, whoever else did that with me. I don't know who it is. Possibly the greatest cartoon theme song of all time. And as those of you who don't know what DuckTales is, there's something called YouTube. Go home and look it up. And they, and they brought it back for the younger generation. The, the new one's pretty good, too. But anyway, you know Scrooge McDuck, based on you know, Uncle you know, Scrooge you know, from Christmas Carol, the beginning of the show, he's always, what's he doing? He's diving in his money bin. He's swimming in his money. He's like, me, 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 my, my, my. But then once the little kids come, he's like, hey, oh. he learned to share. He loves to do, help other people. Uh, yeah. I probably should have referenced the Christmas Carol <laughs> since we're in Flashback Sunday. But my mind, I don't think of the Christmas Carol first, I think of DuckTales, you know. And that brings us back, somehow, to the beginning of verse 21. And now here's why, because DuckTales makes me happy. And this part of the beginning of this verse makes me happy. This is good t- we're going back to verse 21, so look back up here. The provocative sentence that he wrote. For to me, to live is Christ. And to die is gain. I don't know if you've seen this, but there's a popular slogan that people use. A lot of times you see this on sports t-shirts. You know, if there's a sports team, they have all these, like, slogans that are, like, they make t-shirts with. It's like, you know, pain is temporary, pride is forever, or pain is just weakness leaving the body, all this stuff. They also have whatever sports you're playing is life. You know, football is life. Uh, basketball is life. Swimming is life, which is literal because if you're not swimming, you're going to drown. <laughs> so all the rest of them, not so much. But football is life, eh, you know. But swimming is life, absolutely. So what? And so it's not just sports; it's hobbies. You know, like uh, I saw there was a blog post: anime is life. And I know most of you are anime. What's that? Don't worry about it. The ones that know, they know. All right, but it's just whatever, whatever you're passionate about is life. If Paul was going to design his T-shirt, you know what it would say. He says it right here. 
Christ is life. Christ is life. And I know the wording here is a little weird for me to live as Christ, but in the original Greek, is is not even there. And you can, and the way it's written, it's more you can flip it around just as easily. That's one of the weird things about the written language that he was using. It, the, you know, the order of the words could be flipped. So Christ is life. If you're a Christian, Christ and the gospel should be your number one priority. But too often, if we're honest, can we be honest with each other? That's Christ is not our number one priority. We don't like to say this. We don't like to admit it. I am guilty of this, just like every one of you. There are times where the first thing you think about in the morning is not Christ and how awesome he is. Is anybody else going to be honest? All right, you don't have to verbally. Just you know, feel it in your heart. There are times when you are so busy and there's so much to do or you're so overwhelmed with whatever you're facing, your first instinct is not, Christ is life! Very, very small, special group of people can do that, and we need to learn from you people. We need you people. But I want us to be honest. That just even let, Number one, let's be honest that we can admit that. And number two, let's help each other work towards that. Why would somebody wear a T-shirt that says football is life? Well, most likely their sports team gave it to them. But why are they wearing it? Why, why is that a thing? Because... That's how they spend their time. And that's where they exert all their energy. And I want you to hear, I want you to, I do not want you to think that I'm saying football is bad. I will never say that. I owe a lot to football. It was very good to me. I'm paying the price now sometimes, but it was very good to me. I played football all in my early life. It got me to college. Getting me to that college led me to my wife, and things have worked out pretty well. And yes, on Saturdays in the fall, don't bother me because I'm sitting in front of the TV and I'm watching game after game after game. Even the West Coast games that nobody cares about, you're still staying up till like 2 a.m. Yeah, yeah, they sure, yeah. So I'm not saying football is bad at all. I don't want anybody to misquote me or any other sport you want to throw in there. I'm just saying, I'm just saying that that's why. They're wearing that because that's how they spend their time. That's how they spend their energy. Friday night, we were watching a tennis match right? in Giles in March. It was terrible. It was painful. I, I, I was, me, the guy that never gets cold, I was yesterday watching basketball, right? I know somebody was watching basketball. Yeah, yeah, yeah all right. Last night we watched a movie. You know, watching movies is one of my favorite hobbies. So I'm not saying there's anything wrong with hobbies, and I'm saying there's anything wrong with sports. I'm just saying that if you spend all your time doing that, and you have a disproportionate balance where all your time and energy is focused to your hobby, your sport, your outside interests, and you hardly ever look on or think about or reflect on Christ, he's not your number one priority. And if we're honest, since we're being honest, we agreed we'd be honest. Let's just go ahead and admit it. Most of us in here, you probably right now would rather be watching the game than listening to me talk. For those of you who like to listen to me talk, I like you people. <laughs> but if I'm honest, I mean, I know that watching the game is more entertaining than listening to me talk. You want to know? I know that. I don't care how good of a talk or a joke I can make. It's not as good as watching this. Because I am, I am a sinful man, I have limitations, the more you get to know me, the more you're going to find out. I'm just a sinner saved by grace, that's why I can be honest with you, that's why I'm hoping you'll be honest with me, we're all in the same boat, I'm not special, I don't even like standing up here, I would rather be down there in the floor so that we're on the same level, but I want to make sure you can all see me, well, I don't know why you wouldn't want to see me. That's why I don't like the term Pastor Chuck. For anybody who's wondering, just call me Chuck. There is nothing special about me. We are all in the same boat. Christ, if you're a Christ follower, we've all been called to the same mission. And I know, and I'm saying all this because the reason, if you're, 
and you might not even mentally, you say, yeah, you know, he's right. I like the Bible part, I like the singing, but he really needs to shut up because i got to get to the game. It's because I cannot fully, I don't have the ability to fully capture for you and describe to you the glory of Christ. Human words cannot fully capture the glory of Christ. Music comes closer because it hits you with the words and the music, the intellectual, the emotional at the same time. No matter how eloquent of a speaker you are, you just cannot convey the surpassing glory of Christ. So that's what I was going, that's what I referred to a minute ago. That's why we got to help each other. We all have the Holy Spirit. If you're a Christ follower, you have the Holy Spirit. Verse 19 talks about the Holy Spirit. We have to help each other reset and refocus. And so since we're talking sports, yeah, I like to talk. I tell you, I talk sports all the time. Let me ask you a question. There's a few of us in here who have coached before. There's a few of us in here that have played before. Would it be beneficial, would it be advantageous for a football player to do 1,000 push-ups the morning of the game? Of course not. Of course not. Why? But why? Aren't push-ups great? Aren't they awesome body weight exercises that anybody can do that builds the strength that you need for football? Yes. Yes, they are. But why would you not do 1,000 the morning of the game? You know why. Because it's not going to help you. It's going to hurt you. What's it going to do to your muscles? It's going to wear you out, and you're going to be exhausted. So how would you complete this push-up regimen? Well, I'll tell you how I did it. I did 50 each day. Every night before I went to bed, I did 50 push-ups. Everything, the workout, yeah, early in the day I did the workout, but every night, every, it didn't matter how tired I was, I did 50 push-ups. I could not do that now. This is the before time. The before time. And it works. I mean, I, I increased my, bat, my max, my bench press max by a lot. I'm not going to tell you how much because I don't want to scare you and intimidate you. But this is a mistake that too many of us make in spiritual matters. We try to do all the push-ups on one day. We come in here on Sunday to get our Jesus fix. We got an hour, we got an hour and a half. I got all my Jesus I need. No, you don't. The same way a football player wouldn't do all the workout the morning of the game because it would wear him out, you can't get your Jesus fix in one hour on a Sunday. It's got to be daily. You cannot come in here on Sunday, think, you, hey, I'm good to go, and then ignore him the rest of the week, and then you wonder, gee, why do I not focus on Christ? That's why. For, for If Christ is life, for life to be Christ, you should be doing this. You should be reading your Bible every day. You should be praying every day. You should be serving others every day. Now, this is not groundbreaking. This is not earth-shattering. You know this. You know that it, it's the same way. You want to, here's a freebie for you. I've been doing a lot of sports talk. Here's, a, here's some financial advice for you. You, want, you ready for some financial advice? I have my father-in-law here today. He's a financial person. I will share this with you. This is free. Free is good in financial matters. Do you want to know? Do you want to know how to be financially secure? I'll tell you. You ready? Oh, here it comes. <laughs> Spend less money than you make. Repeat. That's it. That's it. So how do you focus on Christ? Read the Bible. Pray. Serve others. Repeat. It's that simple. It's not groundbreaking. See, reading the Bible is God talking to you. Do you realize that? This is a gift. We talked about it last, last week. God gave this to us. It's Him talking to you. But He doesn't want, He's a good Father. He doesn't want a one-way conversation. So it can't just be reading the Bible. He also wants you to talk to Him. And that's where praying comes in. For the Christian, this is like breathing. You inhale Scripture. You exhale gospel prayers. You inhale scriptural truths. You exhale 
gospel-centered prayers. And then, for serving others, that doesn't just mean serve others on missions or serve others in ministry. Should you be doing those things? Yes, you should. When you have an opportunity to share, the, uh, to advance the mission or serve in ministry, you should. God's wired you, designed you in certain ways. But it could also mean helping those you're closest to. It could be your loved one. You know, serving others could be as simple as just, you know, doing something nice for your wife. Reaching out to your friend who's had a hard week. Just taking your neighbor's trash can up when you take yours up. Being... Being understanding when your kid, when your son, when your daughter is trying to talk to you about something that they really need to talk to, and actually do this, actually listen. Don't underestimate the power of listening. Those are all ways you can serve others. And this is, this is what we've been talking about in our discipleship workshop. This is stuff you're going to hear from me. This is, when you join a Bible study group, you're going to hear this. Here's a way you can serve other people. Simple way. Who are three people close to you but far from God that you can be praying for, investing in, and inviting to? If you got three people that you can say, those three people, I'm going to be praying for them. I'm going to be looking for a way to invest in them. I'm going to be looking for a way to invite them. Maybe to Easter. Maybe they don't have a church. Maybe to the, you know, to serve alongside of you with the food pantry. I don't know. If you got three people, you know you do. Pray for If you don't, Pray for God to show you three people. For me, it's coworker one, coworker two, friend of, or son of a friend, and I have four, I'm cheating. One of my uh, English learner students, one of my refugee students. All right, she needs Christ. Those are my four. Who's your three? And then the, you'll hear this too. Two, these are these. We call these our three, two, one questions. Who's three people you're? Uh, who's three people close to you but far from God? You're praying for, and invi- investing, in, inviting to. Two, where are two places you're serving, or how are two places you're? How are two ways you're serving? And then one, are you reading your Bible at least once a week, or once a day? Once a day, are you at least? Are you reading your Bible at least once a day? And, in your, and when we get to the Bible study groups, I hope we create an atmosphere where we're honest with each other. And then one of the first things we talk about are your 3 2 one. How's your 3 2 one? Did you have a, Were you able to share the gospel with them? No? Okay, we'll keep praying for them. Hey, where, how are you serving? Oh, you, you signed up for the work day? I did too. More about that in a second. Or hey, and then the simplest one is how were you this week reading your Bible? Well, I was 5 for 7. You know, we're, be honest, I was 5 for 7. Saturday, you know, Saturday got away from me, Tuesday was rough, I was 5 for 7. You know, those are just ways that we can, remember, how can we help each other refocus and reset? An eternal mindset focuses on the eternal. It's that simple. I'm just, I'm throwing out all of these nuggets for you today. It's not focusing on the temporary, because and I mentioned this before, we all know that life is busy. Especially when you have kids, plural. You got the one kid doing that, you got the one kid doing that, you got that with your job, you got that with your church, you got this, you got that, you got that, and you're going this way. It's busy. I know that. Try to build in some margins in your life. You know, like your notebook paper, you know, the two things that go down the side? The red line, that's a margin. Build some margin in your life where you're not being rugged, ra- ran ragged. All right, build some margin. And, when, and, that, and just know that when you feel overwhelmed and you're like, oh, you get to the end of the day and you're like, oh, I haven't prayed today. I haven't read the Bible today. Don't let that stop you. Just say, Jesus, I need you. I'm sorry, today was rough. I was tired. I was too busy. I need you. Let me see you. Let me feel you. That's, fun. that's how you discipline yourself. Because I want to make sure you understand something. I'm talking about priorities. I'm not talking about you just walk away from everything fun and devote yourself to some type of pious life of monasticism where everything you do is spiritual. 
That's not the kid. That's not what I'm asking. That's not what I'm advocating for. God doesn't want God doesn't want us to never experience pleasure. If you were here last week, I told you pleasure was God's idea. He designed it, and He wants. It's okay to be entertained. God has given us that blessing that when we're overwhelmed, we can we can rest by what by listening to a story. From the very beginning, people would tell stories. Now we get to watch stories. Stories refresh you. Stories can teach you something. God can use any story, even a cartoon show, to share a gospel truth with you. you get, in fact, I've heard it argued that every good thing in this world, everything you enjoy, is a preview of the world to come. You know when you go to the movies... Talked about sports, and I'm talking about movies. You go to the movies, the trailer that runs before it. The trailer is never as good as the movie. This life is pretty good, but it's just a preview for what's to come. And what's to come is so much better, so much greater than anything that we can imagine. We need, if we're a Christian, you need to cultivate a biblical view of death and life. You look back, to what Christ accomplished on the cross for us, and you look forward to the day when Christ will appear for us. And that could mean when Jesus returns in glory and He breaks the seal and He's back and He's going to set all things right, or it could just mean when you individually take your final breath. Because when you take your final breath and your eyes close, the next, if you're a Christian, the next thing you see is Jesus. Because Paul writes in 2 Corinthians, when this body dies, we get to be with Jesus. Now some of us sitting in here, some of us listening online, not watching today, maybe you've never come to that understanding. Maybe you don't know what it means to follow Christ. Maybe you've never said, Jesus, I need you. I need to feel you. I need you to save me. Maybe you're trying, maybe you're worn out because you spend all your time trying to earn your way to God. If I'm good enough, if I do the right things, God will accept me and I'm, maybe I'll get to go to heaven. And I'm going to go to heaven so that I can be reunited with this person and that person. That's not, that's not how it is. That's not, if you're trying to earn yourself, if you're trying to earn your way to God, can I share with you the good news of the gospel? You cannot get to God so don't even try. Here's the good news. God knows we can't get to Him, so guess what He did? He came to us. That's why Jesus came, to get to us. To redeem us, to save us, to say, you belong to me. I think Christ is life is a pretty good mantra for living day to day, and I think Focusing on when we see him again and what he's done for us, I think that is a pretty awesome thing to celebrate. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you've done. Jesus, you saved us. All of us are sinners. It's not just me. Each and every one of us, we have failed to honor you every single second of every single minute of every single day that we've lived. Sometimes consciously, sometimes, sometimes unconsciously, we have failed. We have sinned. Lord, your Bible teaches us there is no one holy, not one. Thank you for telling us that. It would be so sad if we did not understand our need to be saved. Thank you, for, thank you for telling us that, for teaching us that, but then, Jesus, thank you for making a way. You are worthy of all honor and glory and praise because you, you lived the life that we could not live. You were perfect every single second, every single minute, every single day. You were faithful even to your death on the cross. And Lord, as you took on all the sin of the world, all the hurt, all the pain, you were separated from God the Father. 
because you became sin. And you died the death that we deserve to die. You died that death so that we don't have to. Lord, I pray that I pray that this conversation about death will cause people to do a serious heart inventory. Let them be honest with themselves. Say, yes, I know Christ. Yes, I trust in Christ. Yes, He's my Savior. But Lord, if they cannot say that, I pray that they will listen to your Holy Spirit that's whispering in their ear right now saying, you need Jesus. Lord, I pray that they will call out to you for the first time, Jesus, save me. And we thank you that you will. Because you are, you are the one who promised, and we know that you are faithful to do all that you have promised. And one of those is forgiving us from sins. One of those is giving us eternal life where we don't have to fear death. It's just another stop in our journey to be with you. In your holy name,